Matthew chapter 7, I'll read verses 13 through 27. And Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fruit, uh, bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, and thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose And the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. This is God's word. We've been looking at the hard sayings of Jesus, and we found some more. And we also know that the weeks right before Easter are traditionally called Lent. And Lent in the Christian uh, church has been a time of self-examination. Well, the theme of self-examination and the hard sayings of Jesus intersect here at the end of what's been called the Sermon on the Mount. Because Jesus says how critical it is for us to discern the true from the false, to examine. And he gives us three areas. In verses 13, 14, and 15, he says, in the world you're going to find presented to you various ways to God. People are going to make various claims and say, this is the way to God, this is the way to God. He says you have to discern the true from the false. They are not all true. He says, secondly, you will have lots of teachers. You will have people who come and say, I am a spiritual teacher, and you must follow me. But, he, Jesus says, you have to discern the truth from the false because not all of them can be trusted. Thirdly, most radically, most disturbingly, Jesus says, there are lots of people who think they're Christians, who call Jesus Lord, but not all of them truly are authentic Christians. Some of them are self-deceived. Some of them are counterfeit. Now, for the sake of time, and also to show you that it's possible to have a sermon with two topics instead of three, uh, we're going to leave out the middle, partly because it's not that difficult for the average person to see, of course, there are true and false religious teachers. A very vivid illustration Jesus uses. He says, "Many uh, there are many people who... who, uh, say they set themselves up as a, as a spiritual teacher and they say that they're sheep, that they're sweet and they're kind and they only care about them, but underneath they're wolves who want to use and manipulate their followers. And most of us know that that's certainly true. Uh, and so in a sense, let's, let's not belabor that point. But instead, let's go to the other two areas where Jesus says we have got to be discerning. We have to learn to make distinctions. And we live in a culture in which Making distinctions in these areas is unheard of. And we have not got the skills to make these distinctions. Our culture says it's not a good idea for us to try to discern between true and false religions. Let's just take everybody as they come. Let's just assume that everybody who's sincere is all right. And certainly, 
We're not supposed to go around and discern true from false Christians. How judgmental and how intolerant. And yet Jesus comes right out with two of the most disturbing and controversial statements he has anywhere. I want to look at it. I want to look at it with you. I think it's very serious, and there's, it's, uh, no matter how hard I try to sweeten it, it looks to me, because I've already preached this sermon once, that it's a, just a very sobering, sobering set of teachings. And yet we've got to come to grips with them if we want to make sure that we ourselves are living authentic lives. We all need to make sure we can judge authenticity in our beliefs. So first, Jesus says there are many ways to God presented to us, but you can't trust them all. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leadeth to destruction. But straight is the gate. And narrow is the way. Straight meaning uh, like a straight jacket. That's the, I'm, I'm quoting from the old authorized version. In the old authorized King James Version, it says, straight is the gate. Hmm? It says, wide is the gate and broad is the road that, road that leadeth to destruction. But straight, you see, very cramped. Very small is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. What is Jesus saying here? Very controversial. First... He's saying, everybody's on a road heading for a spiritual destination. Everybody is on a religious path which has consequences in their life. You know, it's a brilliant metaphor. Your faith, your, your spiritual beliefs, your faith commitments are taking you somewhere. See? If you're on a road, that means every minute you're moving one way or the other. And Jesus says, everybody's on a road, everybody has faith commitments, and those faith commitments are taking you someplace. Uh, Now, there's people who will object to what I just said. Hopefully, and there usually are, people in this room who will say, I'm not a religious type. Uh, maybe you have faith, and maybe, maybe there's some people in this room that have faith in this religion, and some people have faith in this religion, but I'm not religious. I don't really have faith much at all. I'm a common sense person. I only believe in something if there's hard proof for it. And therefore, I am not a person who has a life based on faith. That's what you say. But I'd like to show you that Jesus is right and that you're mistaken. Jeff White and I have both been reading a great book on Pascal. Blaise Pascal was one of the great philosophers of history and great intellects of history. And Pascal uh, made a very interesting argument to his skeptical friends. Pascal was a Christian, and most of his intellectual friends in Paris were not. And they had a tendency to say the same thing that I just just, uh, created a hypothetical objection with. They, had a say, they said, well, if you're a Christian, then you have faith, but I'm a person that needs proof. You maybe can live by faith, but I don't. I don't have faith commitments. And Pascal says, that's ridiculous. And he made what's called the Pascal's Wager. And Jeff White and I have been spending a lot of time talking about what a great argument it is. But first of all, he says, here's Mr. X and here's Mr. Y. Mr. X believes that there's a God, believes that there's a judgment day, and that therefore there's a differentiated afterlife. In other words, Mr. X believes that depending on my choices here, my after, the afterlife will uh, be either saved or lost. I'll be either saved or lost. It's a differentiated afterlife. Here's Mr. Y. Mr. Y doesn't believe in God, or if there is a God, Mr. Y thinks, he's not a judge. And if there is an afterlife, there's not a differentiation, you know, lost and saved and so on. So Mr. Y basically is a kind of agnostic and doesn't really believe in God or an afterlife. Mr. X does. Mr. X is on faith, uh, putting his faith in God, and of course cannot empirically and scientifically prove that to Mr. Y. But Mr. Y is also basing his life on faith. He can't prove or disprove empirically whether there's a God, whether there's an afterlife, whether there's a differentiated afterlife, what is right and wrong. And so actually both of them are wagering their lives 
Both of them are gambling their lives on faith commitments, commitments that can't be empirically investigated. Well, somebody says, uh, I, don't, I don't quite buy that. Let me just go a little further. It's not just in the area of religion. Think of marriage. Science can't help you much in that. First of all, scientifically, nobody has ever seen love. You can't examine it. You can't put it under, under, uh, under a microscope. Yes, science is trying to talk about what brain chemistry has to do with emotions, but the fact of the matter is, if I'm looking at a woman and I'm trying to find out whether I should marry her, whether she loves me and I love her, whether we'll be happy together, whether she's everything I think she ought to be, science can't help a bit. It will be a matter of faith. I will develop some beliefs about that woman, and then I will either step out on those beliefs or not. Does this mean it's a total leap in the dark? No, I'm just saying empirically, most of the things that give you meaning in life, beauty and love and relationships, cannot be proven or disproven through empirical investigation. It doesn't mean you don't use your mind. It doesn't mean there aren't reasons for going this way or that way. It doesn't mean you can't examine and find out the authenticity, the inauthenticity of those commitments. There's all sorts of ways to do it, but you can't prove it beforehand. Jesus says, everybody's got faith commitments. No matter who you are, everybody, therefore, is on a road. Every one of you is basing your life and your decisions tomorrow on, the, on whether there is or is not an afterlife, is or is not a judgment day, is or is not a God in heaven who has spoken through the Bible. Don't you see? Everybody is on a road. And everybody has developed life strategies on the basis of faith commitments. And therefore, everybody is being affected and moving on that road because of faith. And what, what all that Pascal tried to argue with people, Pascal tried to say, I want you to see that if you don't believe in Christianity, that's a gamble. And it's absolutely irrational to gamble your life without thoroughly investigating Christianity. Reading, for example, the New Testament all the way through once, since it's the source documents. Have you ever really done that and really thought it through and really talked to people about it? If you say, nah, there's no proof for it, what, there, what proof is there for your position? Don't you see? The only way to be really rational about your positions is to examine them. Admit, everybody is on a religious path going someplace. Also, Jesus is saying, and here's where people really have trouble with him, Jesus also says there is no neutrality. There are not a lot of roads going up the mountain to the same destination. That's the modern image. The modern image is all religions are different, but they're all different roads going to the same destination. After all, they're all after God. They're all, they're all seeking God and salvation. So the, the modern mindset says there are many roads leading to one destination. Jesus, in a head-on collision with the modern mindset, says, no, there are not many roads going, there are not many roads going to one destination, there are two roads going to two destinations. There are not many roads going to the same destination, but there are two roads only going to two opposite destinations. There's no neutrality, no one's on the fence, everybody's on one road or another, going one direction or another every minute. Further from the truth or closer to the truth, this second. Everybody in this room. Well, people say, how unbelievably intolerant. Yeah, because, you know, Jesus t tells you what the narrow way is. He says, broad is the way. Hmm? Hmm? He says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Well, what is that way? What's that narrow way? He says in John chapter 14, and this gives a lot of people a very visceral, a visceral reaction, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. And people say, unbelievably intolerant. What he's saying is you're either for me or against me. There's no neutrality. Well, let me talk to you for a minute about what is tolerance. Is Christ and does Christianity preach intolerance? Carefully, I would say absolutely not. Because you've got to make a distinction. You know what the word civilization means? It comes from the word civil. And to be civil, believe it or not, means to be polite. And therefore, the entire concept of civilization 
is based on this idea that you can show respect and courtesy and cordiality, that you can show respect for people who differ with you. Everything about Jesus' teaching indicates that when it comes to people who differ with you, there is every reason to say that Jesus teaches not just civility, but love. Last week's whole sermon, remember, turn the other cheek, love your enemies. What does Jesus teach? How does Jesus deal with the prostitutes? How does Jesus deal with the Romans and the tax collectors and all that? Civil, love, compassion. Even your enemies you're supposed to love, let alone friendly people who happen to have a different faith. Christianity is not the only basis for civilization, but it's a fine basis for civilization. Many civilizations have been built on the, the, this ethic, the very idea. You're supposed to not only love your enemies, of course, you show civility and respect and tolerance for people of other faiths. We're talking about social tolerance, relational tolerance, legal tolerance, so people are free to, to propagate and practice their religion. See, relational tolerance to show love and, and concern and so forth and show respect and listen to people and treat them courteously. But Jesus says theological tolerance of all faiths is absolutely impossible. And he says it's completely different. And you completely muddy the waters when you say to be theologically intolerant and to be socially, relationally, legally intolerant are all the same thing. Not at all. In fact, Jesus, I think here, is proving that theological intolerance is impossible. You can't say all the roads go to the top. I was reading a book called The Myth of Christian Uniqueness. Obviously, the authors are not excited about the point of view of this sermon. <laughs> and in that book, one of the authors says, you can never judge a religion from the outside. Never. Because religion is a subjective, personal thing. You can't judge from, what, out, from the outside. You cannot judge whether a religion is valid or not. You have to be on the inside. And that's ridiculous. I mean, maybe that is not a very civil thing to say. But it's silly. I mean, it, it's one thing to... In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll try to show you that the idea that all roads go up to the top is much sillier than people arguing that their religion is right and the other religions are wrong. There's nothing inconsistent about that. But to insist that all religions are right, that all the roads are going to the same place, is actually silly. I can be civil about it, but we have to be intellectually intolerant. Hitler, for example, believed he was on a divine mission. Do you really believe that you've got to be on the inside, that you have to have actually gotten in there and decided, well, I'm going to try to take part in this faith? Nazism really had very religious roots. And yet the world by consensus has decided that it's not valid. And as soon as you sit in judgment on that particular religion, then you're already denying your original principle. that all the, See, all the roads do not go to the top. Okay, that's an extreme case. So let's go a little, let's, let me move on a little further. Theological tolerance of all religions is absolutely impossible for anybody. When you say to me, you mustn't try to convert people to your religion as if your religion is superior. What you are really saying is, I want you to abandon your inferior view of religious truth and take my superior view. You see that? Let me say it again. If you say, you mustn't convert people as if your, religious, your religion is superior, what you're really saying is, that your view of religious truth, that all religion is relative, is superior to my view of religious truth, that some religious truths are absolute. And so you're doing the very thing you say I shouldn't do. I'll put it another way. As soon as somebody says, I know all the roads go to the top, and somebody else says, no, I'm a Muslim, and I believe there's only one way, and that's through my religion, and you say, you're wrong, what you're immediately doing is you're saying, your road doesn't go the same place. You're actually saying, I, my, view, my view of religion is superior to your view of religion. So to say, all religions are relative, is a religion, which is now vying with the other ones, and is vying for superiority. Okay? All I'm trying to say 
is to say you can't judge between religions is to judge between religions. To say you can't determine right and wrong beliefs is a determination of right and wrong beliefs. And therefore, you see, for a Muslim and a Jew and a Christian and a Buddhist to sit around and say, you know, my way is the right way, my way is the right way, you know, if they do it civilly, you can have a society. And not only that, to do that is very consistent and rational. But to insist that no view of religious truth is superior, and by doing that, insist that your view of religious truth is superior, is completely inconsistent and very dangerous in many ways. Because you won't see it. At least every other religious proponent admits what they're doing. And if you won't admit it, then you're deluded. The most important thing is to, is to recognize your own limitations, and you can't do it. So you mustn't, mustn't, mustn't say, all religions are rose to the top. They're all different, but they're all going to the same place. All religions are relative, and anybody who's sincere in their religious faith is right with God. Don't you see? Jesus says no. Common sense says no. It's absolutely impossible. And you have to also remember, of all the religions, Jesus is the one that came through and said, I, I'm the founder and I'm God. You know, Islam and Judaism says God could never become a human being. Buddhism and Hinduism says God can often become a human being. But only Christianity says, you see, unlike, Judy, uh, unlike Hinduism and Buddhism, Christianity says, no, we don't believe in rein the reincarnation of God. We believe in the incarnation of God, that one human being was God, or God once for all became a human being. And all other religions say, impossible. The problem is that in these areas, there's a divergence of roads. And either Jesus was a megalomaniac, or was he who he said he was? But you see, there's this great divergence. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. One last statement here. You know what else he says? The difference between the two roads is not only that they diverge, and he doesn't just say everybody's on one or the other, and not just that they diverge, but he says one of them is easy, and one of them is hard. The word narrow in Greek means hard. And the road broad means easy. If you were born in America, you probably grew up speaking English. And you never really had to make an effort to speak English, did you? It was natural. It just came natural. Of course, you did learn it. It wasn't totally natural. But it just came in bits and pieces, and you just sort of grew into it. And you were born on it. You were born into English. If now you want to become fluent in some other language, it takes a tremendous amount of focus and discipline. It means a consciousness. See, if you just don't think about what you're saying, you'll speak your native language. If you want to speak another language, you have to think carefully and concentrate. And what Jesus is trying to say is, how do you know if you're on the broad or the easy road? Christianity is never something you're born into. Christianity is never something that just happens to you. Christianity is never something you're just raised into. It takes in order to put your faith in Jesus Christ, it takes a, an act of the will. It takes a focusing. It takes a moving into something that is unnatural. Whatever is popular, whatever is natural, is broad road thinking. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads us unto destruction, and many enter by it. Nah, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to destruction. Okay, now lastly, Jesus, if you think Jesus is offensive with that first statement, and I know he is, and he tries to show you, look, you can reject Christianity, you can accept Christianity, but you can't work it in to some new form of religion which won't admit its own exclusivity and won't admit its own narrow-mindedness. You know, one or the other, you're on one road or the other, no neutrality, that's offensive. And that offends a lot of people who are on the outside of Christianity. But the second, the second thing that Jesus says here is deeply offensive to people on the inside. He tells us not only must you distinguish between true and false paths to God, but inside the path, inside the way to God, inside Christianity, you have to distinguish between authentic Christians and counterfeit Christians. And he says, 
on that day, now whenever Jesus talks about the day, the day, he's talking about the last day, judgment day. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Then he tells a parable. There was a man who built a house on the rock. And when the rains came and the streams rose, it was solid. And another man built a house on the sand. And when the rains came and the streams rose and the wind blew, it fell. What is Jesus saying here? He says, here's two men. Two homes, and on the outside, to the naked eye, they look identical. But underneath, they have two different foundations. Two radically different foundations. What is he saying? It's possible for people who call Jesus Lord, sitting alongside of each other in the same church, who on the last day are going to find out that some of them he never knew. Never knew. And as we read this passage little beads of sweat start to pop out on our foreheads if we know what we're reading. First, this passage shows us the three traits that both authentic Christians and inauthentic Christians share. They share them. You know what those three traits are? First of all, orthodoxy of doctrine. We're told that these are people who on the last day come up to Jesus and and call him Lord. Lord. Now, in Greek, what they're calling him is kurios. The Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, this was the, the, uh, the Bible, the Old Testament, translated into Greek for Greek-speaking Jews. In that book, the name Yahweh, the name the Lord, the name Jehovah, the divine name revealed to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus 3, is always translated kurios. So in the Greek, for the Greek-speaking Jews, anybody who, who was called Kurios was being called God. And they come to Jesus and call him God, which means they're orthodox in their doctrine. They know he's God. They believe he's the divine son of God. Second trait, they're emotionally involved. They don't just say, Lord. They say, Lord, Lord, twice. Now, the reason that that's significant, as I often like to point out to you, if you're reading the scripture, you'll see that very often, whenever the Semitic language, in the Semitic language, you want to express intensity of emotion, you double the name. You don't, if you're just, if you're going to say, Martha, come here, you say, Martha. But if you want to say something with passion, you say, Martha, Martha. When David was mourning over his son Absalom, he said, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. It's intensity of emotion. They don't just say, Lord. They say, Lord, Lord. These aren't people who simply are orthodox in doctrine. They're emotionally involved. They're excited about Jesus. They weep in the worship services. They're really involved. Third trait that all of these people share, both authentic and inauthentic Christians, the third trait is they're active in service. See? On the last day, they'll say, Lord, Lord, hmm? orthodox and emotionally involved, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And Jesus never denies and says, liar. He doesn't say that. He's, of course they did. They were teachers of the word, to prophesy. They healed people. They did miracles. They led people to Christ. They turned people's lives around. Here are people who are orthodox in doctrine, emotionally involved, and deeply uh, involved in ministry and service. And yet on the last day, Jesus says, I never knew you. Now, wait a minute. Look careful. He doesn't just say here, I didn't know about you. I mean, this, Jesus isn't surprised. He's not saying, who are you? You're not on any of the lists I had here, you know? He doesn't say that. Of course he knows who they are. He says, I don't know you. To word, the word know means I have never had a relationship with you. He doesn't say to them, well, you must be Christians that backslid or something. He says, I never knew you. 
Okay? See the logic here. Is there anything wrong with orthodox doctrine, emotional involvement, or, or deep ministry? No. And as a matter of fact, every real Christian will also have those three traits. But these are also traits we see in people who on the last day are rejected by God, by, rejected by Christ as inauthentic Christians. <sighs> Let me put the logic to you this way. The absence of these three traits demonstrates that you're not a Christian. But the presence of these three traits does not demonstrate that you are. The absence of these traits would demonstrate that you're not a Christian, but the presence of these, these uh, three traits does not, cannot demonstrate that you are because you share them with people who are inauthentic too. Well, somebody says, surely even though it's getting late in the service, you are going to nevertheless tell us what are then the traits of authentic Christians? What are the indicators? And actually, if you look at the passage, you'll see there's only two. And here's how we will conclude by looking at these two. They're the lordship issue and the grace issue. The lordship issue is this. He says, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but the one who does the will of my Father. Now, this is saying something very incisive. These people have an intellectually stimulating faith, and they have an emotionally gratifying faith, and they have a socially redemptive faith. And we all want that. We want to be intellectually stimulated, we want to be emotionally involved, and we want to be socially useful. It's possible to, be intellectually, to want intellectual stimulation, to want emotional gratification, and to want social usefulness, and not want God. Not to really want God. Because if you really get God in your life, you have to give up your own will. And that shows us the difference between someone who is actually trying to use God and trying to serve God. Well, put it this way now. I've had many people say to me, I want the power that we, I, I hear people talking about in Christianity. I want the love. Hmm? I want the power. I want the love. I want the sense of meaning in life. I want all these things. These are the things these other folks have. But I'm a, I wonder whether it will really pay off. It, will it be worth it? I've had some people say, I'd like to have all these things, but I don't want to be in a position where I can't decide for myself whether to tell the truth, whether to forgive, whether to sleep with this person or not. I don't want to be in a position where I don't decide that for myself. And the people in this, believe it or not, listen, the people in this little vignette, the people who are orthodox in doctrine, emotionally involved, and are deeply involved in service, have never surrendered their will. Yeah. When somebody says, I want the intellectual, I want the emotional, I want the volition, I want all these things, I want to be a servant, but I'm afraid of being completely surrendered in my will. I don't want to have to give that up. And I don't know whether it'll, be, it'll pay off and really be worth it. What you're really saying is, how can I be happy and still keep control of my own life? And the answer to that, the answer of the ages, the answer of the word of God, the answer of Jesus Christ is, that's impossible. You, either, you have to abandon your self-will or abandon your hope. You cannot hold on to both at once. That's the message of the Christian gospel. That's the reason why. Here's the first mark of a real authentic Christian. He who surrenders his will. The mark, of a, the mark of an authentic Christian is not necessarily, the authentic Christian is not necessarily more moral, more self-controlled, greater character than the inauthentic Christian. You think that's what we're saying? No. The mark of the authentic Christian who does the will of the Father, the Christian is teachable. Teachable. You can tell an authentic Christian from an inauthentic Christian by how that Christian, that person takes criticism. The chief repenters, the people who are the quickest to admit when they're wrong, the quickest to repent, and the ones who are not galled by it, but who know that this is the way. 
the people who are quickest to say, well, maybe I am wrong here. Who do not, see, the inauthentic Christians, when you, when, you, when you criticize them, they come right down their throat, you think they're unreasonable, and they point to what's right with them. How dare you say this to me? See, the one who does the will of the Father is somebody who says, I surrender my will, which means no, any part of my life, any part of my life, if God is showing me through this person or through the word of God or through a sermon or through a book or through the providential circumstances of my life, if I see that I'm being disobedient, I want to know that. I want to know it. I want to amend my life. You know, there's a place in 1 Samuel 15 where God tells King Saul, Saul, after the battle against the Amalekites, I want you to kill all the livestock. Just destroy all their livestock. And, you know, that didn't make much sense. A lot of obedience to God doesn't seem to be very practical. And Saul says, why? Why kill all this wonderful livestock? So he kept it. And the prophet Samuel came and said, Saul, the Lord told you to destroy the livestock of the Amalekites. Why didn't you do it? And Paul, Saul, uh, Saul looks at Samuel and says, I thought we could offer a lot of it as sacrifices to the Lord. And Samuel looked at Saul and says, to obey is better than sacrifice. And you know what he means is, Saul you fool. God didn't want the sheep. He wanted you. And by keeping the sheep, you kept yourself. By doing it your way, you kept control. Saul said, Lord, Lord, haven't I done great deeds in your name? It's not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, that went into the kingdom of, the, of, of God, but the one who does the will. The one who surrenders the will, that's the sign. But lastly, not only that, the sign of authentic Christianity is the grasp of the grace of God. Look at the two houses. Two houses are both built, and they look the same. And you know what those houses are made of in the parable? You see, this parable comes right after the people who have said, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? Orthodox doctrine, hmm? service, Teaching, ministry. In other words, both of these men are taking all their moral efforts, all their religious activity. That's what the houses represent. But the difference between the two is the one bases the whole house on the rock, Jesus Christ. The other house is on the sand, which means the other house is its own foundation. If you look at your orthodoxy, if you look at your emotional involvement, if you look at your service for God, and you notice that your life isn't going very well, and you're like the psalmist in Psalm 73, and you say, in vain have I kept my hands clean. In vain have I kept my heart pure. I work my fingers to the bone for this God, and what does it get me? Lots of things aren't working out for me. I've tried so hard. I've been good, and therefore God should answer my prayers. I've been good, and therefore I should have his favor. I've done these good things, and therefore God should accept me. You are the, like the foolish man who built his house in the sand because your foundation, your, your, your obedience, your moral efforts, your religious activity is its own foundation. A Christian is somebody who looks, this is what a Christian is, somebody who says, Father, my repentance is half-hearted. My affection for you is cold. Hmm? My obedience is always never more than halfway there at the most. I fail again and again and again, but your son died for me. Your son died my death, lived the life I'd, I owe, paid my penalty, welcomed me for his sake. You see, what does it mean to build your house on the, on the rock? It simply means to admit that a person can only be a Christian by the grace of God alone. Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, my legal and moral righteousness was faultless. My legal and moral record was faultless, but I counted it all as loss so that I could gain Christ and be found in him, not with an acceptability of my own based on the law and keeping the law, but an acceptability which is from God through Christ. Do you see what he just said? He said, until I count my efforts as lost, that means until I see them as inadequate, 
until I realize that I'm saved strictly and completely by the grace of God alone. Then and only then have I built my house on the rock. The lordship issue, the grace issue. People who on the last day say, Lord, Lord, are building. They expect. You notice what they say? This is the thing that you're going to know. Some people are going to go up on the last day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, let us into the kingdom. Look at our accomplishments. And some people are going to come up like the publican next to the Pharisee in Luke 18. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, be gracious unto me, a sinner, because of what you did. And I rest and trust in that alone. You see, if you on that day come up and say, look at my accomplishments, how come you don't accept me? You're like the man who's built the house on the sand. The grasp of the grace of God leads to a surrender of the will. And you know, it, you know what else it leads to? You become personal with God. Personal. That's why Jesus says, I never knew you. You know, you had, this, you had an abstract relationship with me. You believed in me. You know, you were intellectually, you believed in me. But what happens is when you grasp the grace of God and surrender the will, he becomes real to you. The difference between an inauthentic Christian and an authentic Christian when in the prayer life, the inauthentic Christian just puts up a flare. There's no sense of personal dealing. There's no sense of the presence of God there. An authentic Christian is somebody who says, I'm saved by grace alone. I surrender my will to you. You become teachable and humble. And next thing you know, God starts to get real to you. The doctrines that you believed don't, aren't anymore just doctrines. They're love letters. They're truths by which God heals you and changes you and thrills you and disturbs you. The Holy Spirit takes them in. You have a relationship. You know him instead of just about him. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, he says, and I will give you rest. Really? Let's pray. Now, God, we ask that you would grant that everybody in this room might apply this text to their own hearts. Father, it's a fearsome text. And we, we know, Lord, that you don't like to disturb us, that you want to comfort us. I pray that no one here, no one here, who really believes in you from the heart, who grasps grace and has surrendered the will, will be put in doubt by this sermon, by this text. I pray that many people who are not right with you will have the secrets of their hearts revealed, will have the foundations of their life revealed to them, and they might seek you as Savior and Lord. And Father, I pray for my Christian friends here. Help them to see that if they're going through a storm in life right now, help them to see that if their house is shaky, it's because their relationship to the foundation is not what it should be. Help them make a more deep surrender of your Lord to your Lordship and will. Help them have a deeper grasp of the grace of God so that they may be so solidly on the foundation that all the rainstorms and all the windstorms of life cannot shake their house, cannot shake their souls, cannot shake them. We ask for this in the name of Jesus Christ, the righteous one, our brother, our advocate. In his name we pray. Amen. Cannot shake them. We ask for this in the name of Jesus Christ, the righteous one, our brother, our advocate. In his name we pray. Amen. For more of this series and other resources from Timothy Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church, please visit www.gospelinlife.com.